yeah, there's no particular reason for that. So then next, um, we're instantiating the grid object, which is right beneath us. And we're passing in um, the size that we want the grid to be. The initiator, in this case, the constructor isn't going to fill it in. So that next one basically walks through the data we have and sets the grid elements to one where we where we've got stars in the input. It's a Boolean grid. It's not it's an integer. I call one zero. Boolean is true or false. Okay, I guess my question is, if cell is equal to space, what's the value that I don't see where you initialize it? Then we will, when we get down one further, the grid initializes the world okay. to zero. Uh, and the enumerate is kind of a nice function in that, that it returns a pair. It returns a number, which tells you your position, and then the item that's in that position. No, it's a list. Uh, enumerate would work on a dictionary because a dictionary is iterable. <coughs> but when you are over a dictionary, you get the keys, not the values. Uh, so we go through and then we return. Now we get that. Now we're defining up our class. So, so in Python, to define classes, you it's class, the name of the class, and then where it compares to one. And in this case, one didn't really need object, but there aren't, in Python 2, there are two different outcomes. Ways out of work in that case between them. Here we then are starting with a couple double underscore methods who are special. The first one here is double underscore init, which is the constructor. So when I, so in that same when I said grid and then pass it two arguments, this is the constructor and that it gets passed to. So in this case, my Python style is not required. When you're dealing with objects, the first thing asked is a reference to the to the object. Uh, the style from Python says you call that cell. Reality is that's just a variable slot is passed in. I, if I'm used to other programming languages, sometimes you will call it this. And then it's passing in the two arguments. In this case, I want to save them because I'm going to use a few arguments later. And here is where my empty list is created. So I'm creating a So list is, again, the thing to create the list. The repeat function gives me n copies. So that's what when I was importing it earlier. That was just an easy way to get a list of zero. zero. And I'm doing it for the height. So I'm doing it for height terms. Um, the Python, another one of the built-in methods that you can write for an object is underscore str underscore, which is used when you print or get a string representation of the object. So in this case, I've decided that the string representation for the object is the ASCII grid. And the easy way to build that is to create um, to create a list of strings, and then we will eventually join them. So in the output, I want either 
a star saying that there's something in that cell or a dot saying there's not. So what I basically now, so what that line basically does is it starts by, find, by building a, a list of dots or stars and that if statement is if cell, it's kind of weird in my mind the way that Python does that. But <coughs> that first value is the true value for the if statement. So the quote star quote is what the if statement returns if it's true. If that if cell is tr true, and then the else fact value follows after it for the false. And again, making heavy use of generators um, for cell in row. Now when I iterate over a string, I get it. Actually, row isn't the string here. Row is a list. So yeah, I'm getting back the, zero, the zeros and ones to build that up. And so I build up the line, and then I append the line to my output list. So now I have an array of strings that match and then the last thing I want to do is join them so that I get one string back. So what join does is it takes each <coughs> element and adds um, that thing in front, that string to it, in order to create the single string. But it only does that for in between, so I don't end up with a new line at the beginning or a new line at the end, only between elements that list. We'll ignore string one, because that was just drawing it out a little farther. Now in the beginning you stripped out the slash r slash n. Correct. So wouldn't you have to put the slash r in there somewhere? I mean, no. I am in Linux, and it actually turns out, unless you tell a difference in a Windows environment, when you're dealing with I.O., it knows that Windows wants the carriage returns whenever it sees a slash, it turns, or a new line, it turns it into carriage return. Okay. I have the option on open to tell it not to do that. <coughs> then we've got the next method, which is the thing that actually goes and it takes the current grid, it works actually a new grid. So this is one that, from a grid, I ask it for another grid, and then I walk through the grid, uh, asking whether or not I have a new cell, whether or not this cell is alive. So in this case, I don't need any, I don't want anything else other than my width and my height, the x and y coordinates. And to keep them saying that this time they're called row and column. So in this case, range again is returning zero through the number, and since list index from zero, uh, that lets me walk through it and then you can see the new grid dot row, rows it is getting the x and the y, it's getting the row and the column set and it's passing in, um, in this particular case, by named values, uh, or named parameters, it's passing in the arguments to rule so that rule knows the row and column. I did, in this particular case, I didn't actually have to say row equals, column equals. I could have just said row index, column, column index. And then when we've got our new grid built, we want to return it. And this is kind of the reason that they're not Boolean, is to get the rules, it was just easier <coughs> when adding up the neighbors um, to just, keep, just add them. So again, here we're basically looping through um, the, the, the uh, array that we've got. 
die for the rose. So what it's basically doing is it's walking around. Because what I need is I need the count of the of the cells around me. And it's needing the max and min so that it just makes sure that it never goes off the height if I've got a cell that's at an edge. I don't have anything else. And if I tried to access those elements, it would and so, so, then, so then it goes through that and then it needs to figure out the rules for whether or not you, you live or die. Okay. If in life neighbor equals three, you should hit that first if the, it's, if the, the first thing it needs to know is whether or not this, there is anything at this current site. So if, if the, so it will hit the first, so it first comes to that first if, if alive, then it will check to see if the number of neighbors is two or three. Right. If it is, then that cell gets to, gets to continue to live. Right. If it's not, that cell dies and we're returning to zero. Well, you're checking for the number of black neighbors equals three again. So you got the same condition on both sides mm -hmm. of the else. No. The other side of the else is if the cell did, wasn't alive to start with, it needs three oh, neighbors. Okay, okay, okay. So if, the, so if you have a dead cell, if it has exactly three neighbors, it becomes alive. And then for testing, uh, I have to find out one thing so that I can check to see if two arrays are equal to each other. And the easiest way to do that is just to call the string function, which will return a nice pretty printout. If the two printouts are the same, then the two grids are the same. <coughs> actually, that and just to prove that that thing actually was. And here, since we called it, It doesn't, 
the search order doesn't automatically include uh, the ah, that's what you've got that's the instance variable how else would you get that instance variable you need a pointer if I had six grids I need to know which grid I'm referencing the language I use defaults into this and this is yeah, and in fact I don't think you can even change it right. this particular language does not pay that what's that it doesn't behave well it doesn't assume that the class the instance for the object is in the default search order when it's looking up its variables for scope. If you want the actual instance, you have to put self in front of it. Well, any name you want to give it. Any, well, whatever name you give it on the definition of the method. Yeah, but if I thought it's you self, self, you will confuse everybody in the world if you don't. Just Well, that's a it is a convention, right. but it's a very, very much following convention. It's not really like they're driving on the right side of the road convention or somewhere else <laughs> different. It's a so here is kind of the start of the QT, and we'll go through the different pieces here. Um, this time. I pick the other standard, which is if you want to have code that's importable and yet has um, tests in it or something, you typically will do if double underscore name double underscore equals the double underscore main double underscore and that saying this is the file with the interpreter starting. So in this case, I'm using that to, if I wanted to import this program, I can separate out when it's being run as a script from when it's being imported. Uh, so again, the same thing where I'm going after the arguments. In this case, I'm then after starting the QT GUI dot Q application initializes the, the GUI. Then I'm after creating the, the object for running the game of life, showing it, and then telling it to, the show basically exposes the graphics window, and then the, the exec tells the, the, GUI, the GUI to start running its own event loop. I don't know how much people have done GUI programming here, but typically you set up, in the GUI event, you set up the initial stuff, and then you basically go into an event loop waiting for things to happen. And that's what that exact does for you. Um, so here is then what, what it's basically starting to set up. It sets up the main window, and then it gets a board. Builds up the window and then calls start for the board. What that basically <coughs> uh, then does is get me the timer so that every, in this case, second, it will run through a new iteration. So here we're basically in the in the constructor. We're basically starting off asking ourselves for the timer uh, so that we can set our time down. We're then going after again creating a copy of the of the grid. So grid dot light is picking the other import. Where I just import it. Let's get back. This time I use the other style, which brings the world in. So input grid, put it into the grid names into the namespace, so that I have to call it grid dot something in order to 
programs. And so, so I basically get to start. Um, the palette, foreground, background are getting me two colors since I just want to use the natural system colors for on and off. Next grid is what's used to walk through. It, it, it's what the timer is going to do. So timer calls next grid and update. The real thing that we're kind of interested in here is the paint event, and that is when it comes time to output stuff, the paint event <coughs> is, used, is called in order to actually do the real form. Where's your update? The timer is up. on the state, we determine whether or not we want to draw a rectangle in the foreground or the background. Uh, the paint fill rectangle then draws a rectangle and fill, fills it in with the color that I want. Uh, and then here's a simple use of properties. Basically, we're using an app properties decorator that basically says when when you access the width attribute of this op of this object, call this function and return what it returns. Property um, is typically is, is a is typically a value, where a method is a call is something that you call. So if I want to access that property, I can say um, think object dot with, where if I wanted to call. It, I've got to say object dot method name open parenthesis and give it. Um, properties are like this are typically used because you start off defining them as just normal variables, and then you find out later that you've got something that needs to be computed, or you want to hide the fact that that value you're returning is computed and not stored. I want to share it across. You want to use that value between several methods in the plane. Then you would typically just set the value on the on the object. You know, the Python sort of started with the idea instead of making everything a method, and it, even if you're just returning or setting a particular value, just make it you know an attribute. And then if you find later that you have to put more behavior to it, turn it into a property and do that rather than you know, it's, it's, so you assume at first that people can just use the attribute, and uh, you know the code will use that attribute and just use it like an attribute. And it's only then later if you find that oh, it can't just be a value; you have to put behavior into it that you can turn it into a property transparently to all those things that have been using it. You called it a, a decorator. Is that uh, I've heard of a decorator pattern. Is that related to that, or? Is it um, I'm not sure. When you say a decorator, 
you, you were calling that property. A yeah, decorator. when you put an at sign and put it on something, that makes it a decorator in Python. Oh, okay, a Python decorator. Right. The at sign. Yeah. Okay. And what that does is that that takes what's after that at sign as a function and wraps um, that that method that you're defining and the property decorator is one that basically builds Python properties. Um, that's probably a little complicated. I probably shouldn't have done that uh, for this, but I was taking this code from something else. Um, again, to show that yes, it truly does work. got enough time to go through the database one because we're down to about 10 minutes. And I'm not sure how interested people are in database stuff here. Yeah. Um, I, I, okay. I, yeah. we, can, we can attempt to quickly look at it and see. Here we're using a package called SQL Alchemy. It is an LLM um, object relational manager. It basically, its goal is to hide most of the database stuff from you so that you can spend your time worrying at the next level up. Um, we, so here what we're defining are two classes where the double underscore table double underscore defines the table name that I'm in the database. And then um, the attributes to, the, to that object are the columns here. So we're defining column and we're starting now to define up what the data, what that table is to look like. And so column, integer, primary key is making the integers a primary key for us. The next one is creating a column who is a string. And the last one is creating a relationship between two tables. Um, the double underscore RPR function is kind of just the same as string. It's just picking two different versions of that. Uh, but that gives me the benefit of I can easily print out And then I'm defining a second table who is an address, trying just to create a real simple example where I've got um, a user and email ad and email addresses for them. Um, and where basically we attached forward and backward references with the back ref so that given an address, I can find out who the user is. Now, basic setup, um, in this particular case, I'm using SQLite memory module because I don't really need anything specific, and it handles all the abstractions with different databases. If I wanted this in MySQL, I could just change SQLite to MySQL. I can go to Postgres, to Oracle, to MySQL, and there's a huge list of SQL, SQL thing, database servers that this will talk to. It does want an SQL database. It does not work against um, non, the non-SQL database stuff like we're saying. Now. So the next line in here, it creates an engine with that. So the create engine um, gives me the connect, is defining up what I'm talking to. In this case, it's SQL light, and I'm using the memory module version of SQL rather than going to files. 
the echo is used to tell me whether or not I want to see the SQL that is generated as it's working. Then the next thing that I'm doing here